Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our first webinar for 2021 for CCIM Greater Los Angeles. Our panel, Getting Back to the Office, What 2021 looks like looks like for growing businesses and i want to first thank uh our sponsors and i think dj if you want to share those uh those those, pe those slides uh without our sponsors we would not be able to pr produce events like this and uh for those of you who uh has to continue to support us year after year we appreciate all the support that you have given us uh especially during this challenging time during the pandemic uh we have our platinum sponsors Continue on. We have our gold sponsors. If you want to continue on. And we have our, our, our silver sponsors. And we also have our bronze sponsors. So we thank all of our sponsors for helping us, uh, supporting our chapter, working with us during the pandemic, and being of value to all of our members. We really, we, we're really grateful for that. So now, starting off our panel, we want to be able to give everybody uh, some background about our spot, about our, our chapter, who we are, what, what, what we do, and also our panelists thereafter. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with CCIM Greater Los Angeles, uh, we are affiliated with the CCIM Institute. The CCIM stands for the Certified Commercial Investment Member. Uh, that This is an organization that has been uh, around for over 50 years, and CCIMs have been recognized as the leading experts in commercial real estate, uh, commercial investment, uh, for real estate. So the CCIM lapel, which many of you are familiar with, uh, actually denotes that the WARE has completed advanced coursework in financial and market analysis and has demonstrated uh, extensive experience in the commercial real estate industry. So we are actually the Greater Los Angeles chapter of an international trade organization. And uh, myself, I am the current president for the chapter and if you like more information, we'll be sharing more information about the organization after uh, the panel, uh, if you would like to learn more. So let's welcome our panelists, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves, and uh, we'll start with the first slide. Brian. Your mic, you're muted. <laughs> Terrific. Thought that was automatic. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here today. I appreciate the opportunity and good morning, everybody. My name is Brian Metcalf. I lead the real estate insurance practice for Boltman Company, which is uh, headquartered in Pasadena with various offices where 200 insurance professionals. I began life as a, a real estate investment sales broker with, with one of the big uh, uh, firms and 20 years ago morphed into being an insurance broker serving uh, the same community. My days are spent with property owners, managers, and developers, either placing policies or uh, controlling liability, talking about deals, uh, and controlling cost in all of its various forms. What I'll be sharing today is some insurance lessons from 2020, and there certainly were a lot of them, uh, how insurance is responding to these various crises, what your policies will and won't do for you, uh, some best practices around insurance, including uh, with return to work considerations and notes on the changing state of the insurance market, which is very difficult right now and certainly has an impact on operating expenses. Francisco. Thank you, Brian. Um, now we would like to introduce Lori. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lori Flores and I am a safety and health professional with Bolton and Company. And a little bit about myself, I have been a safety and health professional for about 20 years with about 35 years of workers' comp experience. And shortly before I came to Bolton and Company, I was a Cal OSHA inspector, uh, enforcement officer to be exact. And today I will be talking about steps you can take to make getting back to the office safer and to help your employees feel more secure in the safety of your workplace. Francisco. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, next, I would like to uh, introduce Nicole. Morning. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Nicole Cam. I'm a partner with Fisher Phillips in the Los Angeles and the recently opened Woodland Hills offices. We represent exclusively employers and everything uh, regarding having employees from hiring to termination and in the event of a litigation or some sort of claim. 
we've been on this roller coaster with our client employers since the beginning of COVID, and it does not seem to be slowing down just yet. And so we're going to go through some of the key points. Um, and I'll hand it over to my partner, Hannah, to talk a little bit more about what we're going to cover. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Hannah Swice, and I'm also an attorney at Fisher Phillips. I'm also out of the Los Angeles and Woodland Hills offices um, with Nicole Cam. And um, like Nicole, we spend our time exclusively representing employers, talking to employers, um, and defending employers in all, you know, various employment matters. Um, and we have definitely been you know, hand in hand going through this entire pandemic with employers and guiding them through and going through this with them. So um, we look forward to sharing some more, you know, about this whole situation and what to look forward to, um, you know, as we continue on. Great. Thank you, Hannah. And we have now our one of our board members, uh, actually, Linda Lee. Hi, thanks for having me and good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Linda Lee. I'm with Peter Matthews Commercial Real Estate here in uh, Pasadena, California. And um, my area, uh, I'm a commercial real estate broker and my specialty is in office leasing and sales within the Tri-Cities and Western San Gabriel Valley office market. Today, I'm gonna be talking to you about um, what's been going on in the commercial or in the office market within Los Angeles County and uh, what we've been seeing the last 12 months, what we were seeing trending recently and what we may be seeing uh, coming in 2021, some opportunities that are out there for affordable space and what landlords can do to secure uh, tenants. So that, that's what I'll be speaking about today and uh, look forward to getting started. Great, thank you, Linda. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm actually with uh, Williams Capital Group. We're a family-run, private money, mortgage debt enterprise, and I will be moderating this panel. Uh, I'm actually also representing CCIM as the CCIM Greater Los Angeles president, president for 2021. So thank you, everybody, for joining us to here today. And uh, we're going to get started. So to give everybody a preface about what we're, what we're committed to sharing to our audience today is really craving you guys some insight on how people can actually get back to work. What are the challenges? I think Han, uh, Nicole shared uh, some points. I think the perspectives of everybody who's here on the panel has an immense wealth of, of insight and experience in the subject matter and can really address a specific issue from multiple perspectives. And that's what we want for our members and for our community to really uh, look at when you have these issues uh, because there's multiple multiple stakeholders involved and fundamentally a lot we want to be able to create a environment but also a pathway for people to actually grow in their business uh, during this time. So uh, our CCI as CCIMs and uh, in our, in our for, for our members and for our community, uh, we want to really you know drill down and ask all the questions we can to help you help everybody do more business. So let's get started. Uh, I think we have our first speaker, I think uh, Linda Lee, if you wanna start us off. Right, I'm gonna do a little share screen. I put together some data and uh, uh, let me do that right now. Let's see. Share screen. Is that coming through? Okay, great. So the topic for today's discussion webinar is getting back to the office. What looks what what does 21, 2021 look like for growing businesses? And I think that's vague enough to go into a, a wide range of topics, but I'm going to try to keep it very, very simple to a few points. And I'm going to start with some some statistics of what's been happening in the last 12 months and then lead into you know what are, what the opportunities are for affordable space and what we can expect in 2021 and some advice that I might want to share for 2021. So, uh, let me see. Page. so uh, using, uh, uh, here's some statistics that I pulled from CoStar. Uh, CoStar just published a uh, office market 2021 uh, mar mar office market report. 
And just some highlights from this report that I wanted to share is that over the past 12 months, there's been 1.9 million square feet that's been delivered to the market. We've had a negative net absorption of 9.2 million square feet. Uh, what does that mean? It represents about 2%, 2.1% of the total inventory that CoStar tracks. Uh, we have a 12.7% vacancy rate currently, which is an increase of 2.4% over the past 12 months. Our availability rate, what does that mean? Is that the availability rate is different from the vacancy rate. It's what's actually being offered on the market. So it's higher at 16.7% versus the 12.7% that you see. Um, and that includes sublease space, uh, which isn't usually accounted for in the vacancy rate. Um, so that means that we have more space on the market than what, um, what is being shown. Uh, sorry, I'm jumping around here. Uh, currently, there's 8.2 million square feet of space under construction. It represents about 1.9% of total inventory. And we've had a rent decline, uh, not a rent growth, but a, a, a minus 1.7% in rent, um, rent growth over the past 12 months. Leasing activity has been down, down 50% since pre-COVID, but um, up 10% in the recently compared to the previous quarter. So this is just some statistics I wanted to share with you and what we can derive from that. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, vacancy availability net absorption. So I've broken it down. What does it all mean um, when, when we talk about all of this vacancy that's coming onto the market, where is it? Um, how, do I, how do I understand these numbers? So you'll see in the, net, in the right column, the net absorption, most of the uh, loss, or sorry, the negative net absorption where, uh, where we're seeing more space coming back onto the market is in class A or four to five stars, um, office buildings, high rises. So most of the uh, negative absorption is happening in that sector. Then you have the class B, the Class C, you'll see their, their vacancy rates hovering between 8.3% and 10.5% on the availability. So it's actually still fairly healthy. So I, I want to say that more of the opportunities lie in the Class A and Class B product type. Going into the next um, uh, slide here, where did most of the negative net absorption happen within LA County? And these are some of the cities that I pulled from the statistics. And you can get this, this report off of CoStar. Um, and if you can't get it, I'd be glad to send you a copy. Uh, but these are the, some of the cities that have been hit the hardest during COVID the past 12 months, and they have had a lot more space coming back to them onto the market. Pasadena alone, um, I think, gained about over 700,000 square feet of subway space in the last quarter, um, and which is tremendous for this little small market. And... Um, the next slide tells us, well, where, where was their growth? Where was their positive absorption? And I think you can see from here, these are all just a handful of cities that have actually done well or done fairly decent in the last 12 months. Santa Clarita is one of them. Why? They've, they've actually had a migration of tenants in the last, I would say, two decades because of affordability of housing. Um, so you'll continue to see that trend. Burbank. What can I say? The media. Um, media, media has dominated this past year. Netflix taking more space in Hollywood. I mean, uh, Disney continue to, you know, with their Disney Plus streaming services. Playa Vesta Tech, I mean, that's no surprise there. You're, you're seeing that in the news, uh, where tech companies are growing and taking and gobbling up uh, enormous amounts of space. Financial District, uh, still seeing, you know, the office types like us, you know, we're, we're still continuing to do work, even if it, we're doing it from home. So in that sense, we haven't really been hit that hard. Uh, South Park, close to where um, the, uh, the amenities are. Um, so that's where we've seen some growth and positive absorption. What does that mean in terms of affordable office space? Likely you're going to find some opportunities in the class A and B product types within those sub-markets sub that I mentioned earlier, those cities that were hit hardest. Um, I imagine that landlords in those sub-markets are doing whatever they can to try to lease up their buildings. Um, some, uh, some considerations for, uh, 
for tenants, for companies out there looking for affordable space. There's a lot of subly space on the market right now that can provide you with lower cost alternative and shorter terms. So that's what we're looking at right now in terms of um, uh, opportunities. If you're a growing business and you want to know, well, what other uh, product types besides a traditional non-office product can I consider? Um, we're seeing a trend now where there's, you know, retail spaces, empty storefronts and ground floor office buildings. They're being repurposed for office space again. Uh, there was a time when office, ground floor office space um, was desired and then they were not desired anymore. People preferred to be up above in the top of the floors um, of these buildings with great views and away from the street level. And now it's coming back again because it's easily accessible. And given COVID times, uh, people don't want to be crowded into an elevator, even though now, now we have all these labels distancing or limiting the number of people in an elevator. Um, I think that a lot of people are still preferring to be able to get in, get out of a space uh, easily and more accessible. Um, retail sp space and shopping centers, one of our clients, uh, Brookfield ha is repurposing uh, uh, 45,000 square feet of retail space in one of their centers in Northridge and looking for an office user rather than a retail user. So you're, you're gonna see that kind of trend there as well. Freestanding buildings repurposed for office use. I mean, it could have been a freestanding building for a gym, a, a, whatever type of use. I think office users are looking for those as well again, um, just because it's more easily accessible. Uh, what can owners and landlords do to attract and secure growing tenants? I mean, I think some of the first two, uh, cleaning, sanitizing protocols, invest in technology, those are already being done. They've, they've been doing this pre-COVID. Um, and during COVID. So let's go back to the, the next three points, amenities. Um, still the most important things are amenities. Uh, you know, is there food service, outdoor area where people can, you know, come together? Can they go, uh, you know, do their shopping during break time? I mean, I think it comes back to still amenities are still very important to tenants. Flexibility. Right now is a time to negotiate all kinds of flexible options in your lease. Options to expand, options to contract. We're seeing you know, deals um, being negotiated where you can occupy now and pay later or commit to occupying at a certain time and paying later. Um, it is right now flexibility is key. And of course, at the end of the day, the most important point is cost of occupancy. It always has been, always will be, pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID, cost of occupancy. And, you know, concessions, I, I mentioned in here, concessions, landlords are offering all kinds of concessions these days. And the first slide I mentioned earlier that we were looking at only a negative 1.7% in rent growth. Um, so a decline of only 1.7%. Some people might say, well, that, that's not very much. Well, that's because they're being boosted by the concessions that you don't see. So an example would be uh, one of our clients pre-COVID negotiating with a tenant who, you know, uh, held off negotiating for, for a, a good 10 months. You know, uh, you know of course, it's, it's um, due to uncertainties and wanted to wait and see what's going to happen. So here they are 10 months later and the landlord is providing them maybe 30% more um, concessions than they did pre-COVID 10, 10 months ago. So um, you're gonna see a ton of concessions being thrown at tenants, especially quality tenants and tenants who can commit to longer lease terms than ones that are looking at shorter terms. Um, and uh, so it's a great time for tenants to get back out there and negotiate, restructure their leases if they have one in place, um, negotiate new ones. Uh, if they're looking for more space, plenty of options, affordable options out there, such as sublease space, um, repurposing other types of product um, than the traditional office space. So it's a great time for tenants. What to expect for 2021? You know, the numbers that I shared earlier, they show what happened. It's usually, there's always a lag period. There's always about three months, a quarter, several months of lag time. So I think we're gonna to continue to see this lag in the numbers reflected for the first and second quarters, but we're already seeing leasing activity pick up. And so 
you know, we won't see, um, it's always trying to catch up. The, the numbers are always trying to catch up to what's actually happening. So we're seeing activity happening, um, pick up, leasing activity pick up right now. And, and we, can, we will continue to see that as more vaccines are being distributed and people are feeling more comfortable going back to work. Um, but, we're, but the numbers won't reflect that and we'll continue to see that um, you know, there might be more space back on the market. Rents will continue to decline in the next quarter or two. A lot of firms are pointing to summer to reopen and getting back to the office. So, you know, we're, we're seeing that this, there will probably be a slow recovery between the third and fourth quarters. Now, um, this is all uh, with in mind that, you know, the vaccines being rolled out, companies are going back to the office. But, you know, I just want to be cautious and caution uh, that, you know, this, this disease is, um, is, a tricky one. And it's it, so far we've seen a couple of variants are out there. We don't know if there will be another mutation that perhaps we'll need another type of vaccine to counter. So, you know, I, I want to be cautious that everybody, you know, it, it might seem like for some that um, people might be getting back to work um, and then things might be going back to normal, but anything can happen. And uh, that's why I want to be very cautious and caution that um, I'm cautiously optimistic that we will get back um, to, you know, getting back to work, but that anything can happen. And um, hopefully, you know, uh, uh, you know, business will be getting back to, you know, pre-COVID times, fourth quarter, third, fourth quarter. But I think 2022 is probably the safest bet. <laughs> Um, well, let's let's hope let's hope that we have some adjustments there. I think we're hoping to see some some great ways so that we can have uh, landlords mitigate their you know mitigate their risk. And oh, apologies, Linda, did you want to finish her? Right, right. So the last thing I have is just you know what's the advice for twenty twenty one? Sorry, I think this this screen fell out, but um, uh, there it is. Uh, going back to the box. You know, my advice for 2021, you know, companies should take advantage of current marketing conditions uh, for reducing occupancy costs, like what I said earlier, restructuring, if you haven't already done so, if you've been on the sidelines, um, get back in right now, uh, you're going to find some great deals out there and landlords want to deal. Some of them may have held off and wanted to see what happened, but I think a lot of them are coming to the realization that they have to come to the table or they're going to lose out. Um, owners and landlords should do whatever they can to secure the tenants. Uh, because the market will continue to lag through the second and possibly the third quarter. Uh, so I'll leave you with that. Thank you, Linda. Great insight. And I think that gives us a foundational piece for the discussion of the marketplace. And uh, thank you, Linda, for providing the stats and reviewing those, those points. And I, I think we really touched on a great subject of uh, the risk, the, the, the risk tolerance and, and, I, and going into that subject matter, because I think that's a great segue for insurance. And I think Brian... I mean, if you can kind of give us some some perspective and, and continue to let, let's, how does that look when it comes sure. to the office space and so forth? Because I know you have some great case studies. Sure, Francisco. Uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, what insurance is covering and not covering. Uh, and probably the biggest item over the last year and still going forward is lost rents. Uh, landlords are certainly concerned with uh, rents that they've had to give up, rents that they're having trouble collecting. And the expectation was by many was that since we pay for lost rents coverage, perhaps we can go collect under this from our policy. So I'll start with an example. When you have a fire, the carrier will redamage, excuse me, will rebuild the, uh, the building. It's not really a very difficult claim. And because the building was damaged, uh, they will pay for the fact that the uh, tenant isn't going to be paying during that period of restoration. That's very easy. You had a fire that was covered, and as a result of it, you had lost rents. COVID's a different animal. With COVID, there was no actual physical loss, and that's a term that comes from your policy, actual physical loss, to trigger the lost rents coverage to begin with. So one of the first things I did when I was sent home from my own office was to advise my clients, look, we can make we can make this claim, and if you'd like to, we will, and we have done. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, to manage expectations, this does not look like something that's going to be covered. Fast forward to today, and uh, and that has been borne out. Uh, uh, thousands and thousands of claims have have made that obvious that the lack of actual physical loss doesn't allow you to collect the rents. Another equally important thing is that most policies, not all, but the standard is that there is a virus exclusion under the policy for uh, lost rents. So wow. uh, that, that's been argued in the court as well and not successfully. The, the argument from some brilliant lawyers has been that the presence of a virus constitutes physical loss hard to prove it doesn't really it hasn't borne out in 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 uh, litigation now i don't want you to think that insurance isn't paying for this because the insurance industry is actually very stressed with all the claims that it has been paying just not on that line of coverage so moving from there to things that it is paying and will pay in 2021 and this may bear on return to work are things like comp uh, california comp pays for uh, ha has provisions now to pay for coronavirus loss and millions are being paid out because of that. That's a good thing. We need that. DNO, Directors and Officers Insurance. What that covers you for is not what your the liability arising from what your company does or what your space does, what happens in your space, but rather uh, your decisions about how to handle things, your decisions about you could conceivably be uh, sued for how you how you stewarded your company with regards to COVID. And in that case, a DNO case might very well be valid. And we are seeing successful claims activity under DNO. Uh, another important one is EPLI. Uh, your tenants and perhaps your companies, if you have uh, employees or lots of employees, uh, uh, may have had layoffs and had to fire people, et cetera. And so there's a lot of claims arising that bear on how people were treated in the course of that. And just because it happened because of COVID doesn't exclude that. Those respond just as they are always would have. There've been a lot of claims there. So transitioning from what is and isn't covered, let's move to some other considerations. 2020 was a year when we saw, I won't say unprecedented civil unrest, but civil unrest that we haven't seen in many years. Uh, and that is pushing our market upwards as well. I got a lot of calls from word clients that have Main Street USA properties saying, is this gonna be covered? What's gonna happen? We know there's a demonstration covered and coming. And then behind them comes all the hooligans that are breaking things and spray painting and doing who knows what else. You mean about else. the riots. You mean about the riots and the different demonstrations across the country uh, Correct. On, around commercial properties. Got it. Okay, just wanna- Correct, well, because, of, uh, because of social issues and that may happen for political reasons in 2021 as well, there was just a, a domestic terrorism warning relating to that over the last couple of days. Good news there is that's very easily paid. Uh, that's covered in your policy. Uh, we generally see no problem whatsoever with that with that type of loss, and that's a good thing. Uh, I'll move to vacancy here. Vacancy is something that's very important to understand, including in the context of civil unrest. So. To, to give some background in information, uh, understand that a basic policy, what we call an ISO policy, has some very strict exclusions with regards to vacancy. And vacancy is defined in various ways in various policies, but I'll give you the standard definition, which is that uh, when occupancy drops below 31% for 60 days, coverage is eliminated for certain things, including vandalism, glass breakage, water damage, and theft. So there are some others. Those are the major ones. So put those two ideas together. You're having all of this uh, civil unrest at a time when COVID has made a lot of buildings go vacant or be poorly occupied. Uh, my, my point here is twofold. My first point is definitely find out what your policies say about vacancy. It's not something that people focus on when they're renewing coverage. Uh, vacancy is an important issue, especially if you've got single tenant buildings that can go entirely vacant. Second point is just that this is, as I've said, more relevant now than ever because COVID is causing so much vacancy. Uh, and your, your insurance professionals may have pointed this out to you. If you feel unsure, feel free to send me your policy or, or contact me and I'm, I can take a quick look. 
moving more specifically to building condition and, and returning to work, I think it's a great time as tenants are reoccupying to go to the building and do a thorough search of the building as you, as you normally would do. But this time we'll be looking at it in terms of are there things that we can claim because we couldn't claim our rents successfully. Is there vandalism? Is there broken glass? Is there water leakage? Has there been weather damage? I'm not advocating turning in small things because I think you should pay for that out of capital expense. But it's a time to say, you know, maybe we can find 100000 or $50,000 worth of damage and, and claw back some dollars that we lost to rents. Finally, I'd like to wrap up with some general comments about the market, which I normally wouldn't do in a return to work uh, seminar. But all, all that we're talking about with insurance is happening in a background of the worst insurance market in, in 20 years. Uh, premiums are much higher. It's hard to get coverage, hard to get limits. For a few reasons, we're coming out of a period of pretty flat, pretty reasonable, what we call a soft market. May not have felt like that, but I, you know, I'm delivering premiums that are flat, 5%, minus 5% for the last eight years. So now over the last one and the next couple, it's shooting up. It's because of COVID. There are many ways where carriers did pay out uh, COVID claims and have taken overall losses because of that. All the wildfires were terrible. There's more litigation of, than ever, and there's higher verdicts than ever, which sucks capacity out of the market. And then global weather-related catastrophes are higher than ever. I'll give you a quick example there before wrapping up, which is that storms are named alphabetically. The first one will be Alfred and then et cetera. Uh, and we might get into J, M, L in the course of a, of, a, of a year. This year, we went entirely to the alphabet, started on the Greek alphabet and made it, if not all the way through, and we may have made it all through, substantially through that alphabet as, as well. The last item is that carriers are not making investment returns anymore. So the model used to be taking a premium dollar, dollars, invest it, make money, and then we pay the claim there's some vig, there's some difference there we can make some money. So I'll, I'll cut myself short there and send it back to Francisco. No, Brian, thank you. Thank you for a lot of those points. I, and, and I do want to open up a couple a couple questions because I, I do have some questions and I think yeah. a lot of our members would really appreciate it because you you talked about uh, first the civil unrest. And I think that we spoke with one of your colleagues uh, in regards to the precedent behind this, because there are specific actions that landlords need to take in order for them to have protection for, let's say, protests and so forth. Could you uh, describe a little bit about what landlords need to do in order for them to actually be, be covered under these mm -hmm. demonstrations? So it is appropriate that you take reasonable precaution to protect the building. I, I think that's probably what you're pointing to. Uh, specifically, uh, if something sudden were to happen, sudden is a magic word in insurance because it shows that it, it was an accident. The damage was accidental, came out of nowhere, that I wouldn't worry about uh, preparation for that. But in the case of an announced demonstration in an environment where these things have gotten out of hand in some cases, not, not in all cases by any means, uh, it is appropriate to, to take and preserve the value. But you trigger something else in me, which is what happens after a claim. And this applies certainly to uh, civil unrest, but to any property claim, which is that you have the right and responsibility to protect the damaged area against further loss. So for example, you have all the glass blown out of the building. Uh, you can't leave it there for a week. Or if there was fire suppression on a, on a fire that started after one of these things, you can't leave it wet for a week and let mold grow and expect those things to be covered because that happened not because of the riot or the fire, et cetera. It happened because you, you didn't address it. So we're at big, during big losses, we're constantly telling people do, even without the carrier's authority, go to certain steps and expense to take reasonable precautions against further loss. Thank you. Yeah, because that's one thing that, you know, there's a lot of people who have actually experienced these vandal these, these acts of uh, va uh, vandalism uh, in Los Angeles and different parts of, the, uh, of uh, L.A. County as well. So I, I want to also bring that up. And you also bring up the wildfires. I can definitely see how that is. But you mentioned one key point that 
if you could also maybe add, if there's anything additional when you say that this is the worst insurance market in the last 20 years yeah. i mean i we understand the different i think when you said covid you have the wildfires there's litigation the the there's glo- weather global uh, t- disaster uh, weather disasters i mean are those the only things that are actually affecting it, and especially when you have, let's say, landlords who have single tenant buildings that have, you know, again, the set in vacancy. I mean, how can someone who's trying to, again, grow during this market, how could they, again, mitigate some of these some of these factors for their building? I mean, how can they work with you on that? So I think that's a, that's a pretty complete list of the major items that are that are moving the market to put yourself in the best position as you're marketing your risk to the insurance marketplace, create a great narrative about how well you steward the buildings, how well that you can implement uh, safety features. Carriers really believe that when they give you something to do to the buildings, that that will affect your loss. So be able to say, this is how we manage our buildings, whether our, whether through ownership or a third party manager, that we can diffuse that, monitor it and know that it works. Look at your losses, look at each of your losses and be able to tell a story why that loss does not predict future loss. So someone fell down the stairs, you wanna be able to say, they fell on this, we removed that and it's better than ever because of such and such. Or we had uh, a water loss because one of the sprinkler heads came loose. That is not predictive of future loss because we replaced them all and now we have it monitored monthly, for example. Uh, so your narrative to the carrier with regards to how you will c- control future loss is very important. This is an item I could go on a long time about, so I'll, I'll cut myself short there. No, thank you. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate it. And I think we really go into a different segment of this. And I think Nicole and Hannah have a great perspective about, you know, how are the people, you know, what, what, what's going on with the people and the businesses themselves in these buildings. So if Nicole, take it away. Thank you. We're going to put up our PowerPoint as well. And, um, and then I'll hand it over to Hannah to get us started. Yeah, well, thank you. So, I mean, you know, as everyone has already discussed, there's a lot that that's been going on this year. Um, So, you know, as we mentioned, we represent employers and we've been dealing with a lot of these issues. So these are issues, you know, if they're your clients um, or if you're advising, you know, kind of on looking at some of these issues and returning back to the workplace, um, you know, there's a lot to look out for in terms of, you know, from an employment law perspective. And so we have really been, you know, as we mentioned, looking at this and navigating through this situation from the beginning. So from the beginning of COVID, you know, all of us have been looking at, you know, what orders in place, where are we at? And so this continues to evolve. So really, um, you know, we're going to really give you a high level overview of some of these major points to look for Um, as you continue to navigate through the situation. And then, you know, in further detail, you can always, you know, feel welcome to reach out to us. Um, But so looking at this, you know, kind of big picture overview um, from a legal perspective, what do we need to look at? So we need to look at what is the current federal, state, and local guidance and orders. So as we, you know, even know this week, we've had big change happen um, at the state level. So we had the regional stay at home order that was lifted this week as of Monday. Um, But taking a step back, as we know, we haven't had any, you know, concrete federal directive or order um, in place since the beginning of COVID. But what we have had is we've had the CDC issuing a lot of guidelines and a lot of guidance that has been followed very broadly across the United States and including in California. So that's really kind of in looking at what we see um, in terms of what to follow is we have CDC guidance at the federal level. Now this may change with the Biden administration. We may see some more directives or orders coming down from the federal level. So that is something to look out for as we look into 2021. Um, And then at the state level, what we have is we have the state of California 
um, you know, with we've had executive orders, we've had, you know, the state orders in place, um, including, you know, the stay at home orders that have been put in place. Um, what we've had as more recently is we've put in place, it's, it's come from Cal OSHA, um, which Lori will also touch on as well, is we have a regulation um, that was effective as of November 30th. It is a temporary regulation, but we anticipate that it will continue on to some extent. Um, it's currently in place for at least six months. And so that's something big to look out for because that really does, um, you know, regulate the terms and conditions of the workplace um, with regard to COVID. And then you have local and even, you know, local is in terms of county orders and we have city orders. So we have to look and we're really looking at what is most restrictive and that's what we've been following. Um, so there is a lot to look out for there and it continues to change. We have changes sometimes daily. Um, and so that's that's what's important to keep out an eye out for um, in terms of that. And then the other point I wanted to touch on is that for the various types of business, there are is guidance for various um, different industries. Um, there is state guidance, and then there's also local level guidance that must be followed, and it's very extensive. So those are all kind of things to look out for. And so next, I'm going to hand it over to Nicole to take us through a couple of the other points in terms of supplemental paid sick leave um, and, you know, other reporting requirements. Thank you. So as Hannah mentioned, you know, we have been spending quite a bit of our work time on these issues. And over the course of the past almost year, we've provided, I would say, dozens of webinars. Each of these topics could be a full webinar in and of itself. And so we're really doing just some issue spotting for you as employers, for you as uh, trusted advisors to employers and business owners, these are really important for you to kind of keep front of mind as you're considering this return to work process. So one of the big items was the COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave. Effective April 1 through December 31st, the federal government passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, and that provided 80 hours of emergency paid sick leave and expanded the FMLA uh, for employers with one to 499 employees. So this was on top of any existing paid sick leave, on top of any existing PTO. Employees were entitled to additional paid time off subject to certain caps, subject to certain restrictions if they fell into one of the qualifying reasons. The FFCRA did expire at the end of 2020. However, there was a tax credit, there is a tax credit portion that employers could receive a tax credit for this out-of-pocket additional expense. And that part was extended through the end of March, through March 31st, 2021. So where we're at now is that employers can voluntarily continue to provide FFCRA um, and continue to seek the tax credit through the end of March. But you wanna be very careful as you're doing so in that it's not um, implemented in any way that might be uh, discriminatory or not be properly uh, processed. And so you do want to do that carefully. California also passed its own almost like a stopgap for larger employers, uh, for 500 plus employers that did expire at the end of, of 2020. However, there were many, as Hannah mentioned, we have to look at federal, state, local, and then local, local. So there were many local supplemental paid sick leave ordinances that are still ongoing. For example, the city of LA, Oakland, Santa Rosa, San Francisco city and county, Sacramento city and county. And so you wanna be looking at, is there any local requirement that still may be ongoing to provide additional paid leave for employees who need time off for COVID related reasons. So the next topic is the workers' compensation presumption. And this is something that um, started back in March uh, when the, the governor issued an executive order creating a rebuttable presumption that if an employee worked outside the home, uh, tested positive for COVID-19 within 14 days, there was a rebuttable presumption that the case was work-related, that they contracted COVID-19 through work. That expired, the executive order expired July 5th, but then in September, the legislature passed SB 1159, codifying the executive order, 
and doing three other really important things. So one is the rebuttable presumption still applies to first responders and healthcare workers. In terms of all other employers, there's a rebuttable presumption if there is a situation of an outbreak. And that outbreak is defined differently under, under SB 1159 local orders. Hannah's gonna talk about the Cal OSHA rules. We have all these different definitions of outbreak, but for the purposes of SB 1159, the workers comp presumption, an outbreak is four or more cases within 14 days if you have 100 or more, or I'm sorry, 100 or less employees, 4% of the population if you have more than 100 employees, or if there's a closure by a public health authority. And so in those cases, there would be a rebuttable presumption that the exposure was work-related. One of the main takeaways is the reporting requirement. So all cases, with a few exceptions, need to be reported to your carrier within three business days. And Lori will probably touch on this too, I believe. Um, but th that's the really important part is the reporting requirement because the carrier will use that information then to determine whether there's an outbreak. Now, it's not the same as lodging a worker's comp claim. That's different if the employee indicates that they believe it was a work-related exposure. You provide the DWC-1 form and take it from there. But certain information does have to be provided to the carrier, uh, including the date of the positive result, the addresses the employees worked at, if they worked at a customer location or some sort of other outside location, and then information about the number of employees at those places of work. The penalty for failing to comply is up to $10,000 if there's fraudulent information or a failure to comply. So it is important that this is done. And we often get asked, well, if we haven't done it, should we do it now? And our position is generally to, to stop the bleeding, to make a good faith effort to comply as soon as possible, and to talk to your broker and your carrier to walk you through this process. So yeah, so I think this is a good one, you know, that kind of connects to Brian's point that, you know, a lot of this has been shifted over, right, to insurance. And this is a presumption that, you know, if, if you meet this certain number of cases now, it's presumed that it was COVID related. And so I think, I think that's really kind of one of the takeaways from what we've been seeing in COVID. So moving on to this big standard um, and regulation, as I mentioned. So, um, you know, there's, there's all these different, you know, federal, state, local, can we go back to the office? What, what's the status? So really looking closely at that. But, but so assuming you're back at a physical work location, um, there's this Cal OSHA emergency temporary standard that went into effect as of November 30th. And as I mentioned, it is currently in place for at least six months. Um, this was the first California regulation um, put out by Cal OSHA and specifying really what employers need to do in the actual physical workplace. Um, and so there are some very specific requirements under this new regulation that employers must get into compliance with starting as of November 30th, 2020, but the actual enforcement will start next week. So um, there's going to be, you know, actual enforcement of this starting February 1st. So what are some of these items that employers um, need to have in place? So there needs to be a written COVID-19 IIPP. And so that um, can either be a standalone document or addendum. And Lori's actually gonna go through some of those particulars of what needs to be in that plan. Employers also need to provide notice of COVID-19 um, cases that are in the workplace. So if you actually have a case in the workplace, there's specific notice that needs to go out. And I'm gonna cover that a little bit in further detail because there's also a um, statute that came down that was effective as of January 1, which really implements notice requirements in this context when there's a COVID-19 case and um, what you need to inform others of. And so there's also notice requirements to the local health department when there's an outbreak. Um, there are very specific outbreak definitions in this regulation. There are also several outbreak definitions. Nicole touched on one when you look at it in the context of workers' compensation, but there's also a lot of other competing 
outbreak definitions that trigger a reporting requirement to the local health department. And that is a timed requirement to report um, generally within 48 hours. So, um, and, and Hannah, this is for office, retail, is this for everybody this covers, in the workplace? Or? This covers all employers except um, one specific group of um, workplaces, which are hospitals, um, skilled nursing facilities that fall under an alternate standard. Um, it's called the ATD standard. Um, it also does not apply to all employees that are working remotely and does not apply um, if there's just a single, you know, one employee working at a workplace. Um, so this is really if you have, you know, employees working around each other. So this is very broad. It applies to public entities, you know, private, nonprofit. There's no, you know, size limit. So this is a very expansive um, regulation. One of the big items out of this, um, which goes along with kind of what Nicole touched on earlier is pay that may be continued if there is a COVID-19 case or a COVID-19 exposure. Um, there are some exceptions to it, such as if you can demonstrate as an employer that the COVID-19 case um, or exposure was not work related. Um, also, you're, there's other exclusions, you know, if the employee was not otherwise able and available to work. But a big item under this regulation is that employers do actually need to continue pay when they exclude COVID-19 cases or COVID-19 exposures, which are close contact exposures, and continue and maintain their pay and benefits as they would have if they had continued working. This is huge because there's no cap like we saw under these other kind of paid sick leaves. Um, so it's a big obligation placed on employers. There's also testing requirements. When there's one case, employers must provide testing to those who are potentially exposed in the workplace. Um, and then there's heightened testing obligations when an employer gets into an outbreak. And there's two types of outbreak situations, um, as I mentioned in the regulation, which are generally three in 14 days, so three COVID-19 cases within a 14-day period, meeting a very specific definition of exposed workplace. And then uh, there's also a major outbreak where there's 20 within 30 days. Um, and then there's also some other, you know, workplace safety requirements included. And I think, again, Lori will cover some of that in further detail. And there's a training component in this regulation that must be followed. Um, and you really have to inform and train all employees. Wow, thank you for sharing all that. That's incredible. That's a lot of information that I think a lot of our members would very, would appreciate, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, I'll just add, there's, um, there is quite a bit involved. We have packaged the, um, the template notices, the template training, the template IIPP, um, because it is such a quick turnaround and there are these obligations. So if anybody's interested in reviewing that, please let us know. We're happy to share that. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody on this would really appreciate that. So I definitely want to add that. For those of you who want to get information, please uh, post the chat and uh, we'll reach out to you if you need it. So thank you. Yeah. And so, like I said, kind of almost, um, you know, a, a, another law that really goes hand in hand with that regulation is this AB 685, which has notice requirements for employers um, that employers must comply. So really in looking at this particular law is just if there's a COVID-19 case in the workplace, what notice must go out. And so there must be a written notice that must go out within one business day. Um, it must provide notice of potential exposure to those that it goes out to. It must contain certain language um, regarding anti-retaliation, disinfection and safety, benefits, and some other specifics. Who must receive that notice? This notice must go to employees who were on the premises when the COVID-19 case was there and within its infectious period. And then also it must go to employers of subcontracted employees. And then under the emergency temporary standard, this notice must also go to independent contractors or vendors that were on the work site. Um, there's also a notice component in here to the local health department when there's when the outbreak definition is met and it must be provided um, to the local health department in 48 hours. So again, we ha do have these packets. We put together things to comply with both of these um, very quickly and have those available. So I'll turn it back 
or I'll keep going with this one. Oh, no, I I got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, in terms of returning to work, you're going to want to be thinking about how are we going to be ensuring the safest workplace possible? Um, And you're going to want to be putting protocol in place. You're going to want to be putting, Hannah's going to talk about some of the details, but thinking about before an employee enters the workplace, are we going to be taking temperatures? Are we going to be doing a symptom check? Are we going to be asking them if they've traveled? And what is our policy going to be about that? So you do want to have a written policy describing all the items that you're putting in place to ensure this safe and healthy workplace that's required under OSHA. Um, And then what additional steps are you taking that would be above and beyond? Are you reconfiguring the workspace? Are you staggering shifts? Um, Are you blocking off the the lunch area, the break room? Are you alternating breaks so that you make sure that you're having um, employees maintain social distancing and keeping things as, as compliant as possible? Think about as you're doing this, what wage and hour issues could this raise? Hang the employee for all the pre-shift screening time. So the temperature taking, the symptom checking, if there's a line that forms, all that time has to be paid time. If you send an employee home because they have a temperature or experiencing symptoms, consider whether reporting time pay requirements come into play. And we are already seeing class actions on these specific issues. So employers want to be very, very careful that they're complying with these wage and hour obligations. Um, providing masks, that's a requirement. If employees decide to bring their own mask, if you've already provided it, there should not be a reimbursement issue. But if you're requiring employees to provide their own masks, that could raise an expense reimbursement issue. So again, these are things that we're already seeing in practice that plaintiff's attorneys are really latching on to this. So employers should be very, very conscientious of this and make sure that they're taking all steps to be as compliant as possible. And so, you know, you touched on some of these, Nicole. Um, And so, yes, really shifts, layout, you know, having kind of some safety protocols in place, making sure those are clear, having clear guidelines around those um, and postings, you know, so people are aware um, of everything. So I think really strictly enforcing, you know, at this point, we all are experts at social distancing. What does that mean? Right. (laughs) Um, But really enforcing it and, um, you know, making sure people are following that, strictly enforcing the mask wearing. Um, There are very specific requirements, again, under that regulation I noted, um, but making sure that that's enforced. Um, And then also continuing remote work where possible, even though we're all excited to get back to the workplace. Um, I think, you know, this will be strongly encouraged and continue to be, and you know, probably at least through, you know, a big portion of this year. Great. And then the last topic is definitely the hot topic of the day. It's vaccine consideration. So considering whether your company is going to mandate vaccines, make them optional, maybe strongly encourage, what is the policy going to be? What are the communications going to be? Possibly the education. And then considering what potential legal landmines that might uh, trigger. The EEOC recently issued guidance, so it's it's on the federal level. We still don't have anything in California. California always tends to be more employee friendly, but uh, the EEOC has at least indicated that vaccines can be mandated subject to many considerations like a reasonable accommodation for an employee that has a disability and can't get a vaccine, has religious beliefs and can't get a vaccine. A big issue that we've been uh, uh, analyzing right now is employer incentives and what that might raise. So if you're giving employees uh, a benefit, um, a gift card even, uh, additional PTO, if they get the vaccine, that triggers certain issues under the ADA, HIPAA, um, wellness program rules. And so you want to be really working carefully with your employment counsel through this process. Um, And then think about, again, I'm always going back to the wage and hour because that's the low hanging fruit, but is there any potential wage and hour issues with requiring the vaccine? Is that paid time? If there's a cost for the vaccine, is that something that has to be absorbed by the company? But again, looping that in with the incentive and making sure that you're complying with all requirements. So again, there's so much to, to consider as we go back to the workplace as employers. This has been quite a journey for everybody. Um, and each of these topics, we really could spend quite a bit of time on. But if anybody has any questions at any point or wanted to touch base or take a look at any of our 
we have a really great website, a COVID-19 website that has a lot of information, FAQs, always feel welcome to reach out. Thank you, Nicole and Hannah. Thank you very much. If you guys want to put that in your uh, in the chat, we greatly appreciate that. And uh, and I think you know, talking about the safety regulations, I think we want to hear from the expert, uh, Miss Laurie Flores. Let's hear about what what are they what is California doing to us? We're we're gonna have to start bubble wrapping. What are we doing? <laughs> Go ahead. And mute myself. And. Um... I'm going to share my screen. Okay, thank you, Hannah and Nicole. I'm so relieved that you handled the, the law part of it, because <laughs> that's always a sticky situation. I'm going to focus on the safety and health for employers and the tips that you can uh, that you need to pay attention to to help bring your employees back to work safely. So according to an article from EHS Today published on January 18th of this year, employees don't feel safe going to the workplace. A study commissioned by Honeywell and conducted by Wakefield Research surveyed 2,000 workers in late 2020 and it says that 68% of the workers globally do not feel completely safe working in their employer's buildings. The number is higher for those working remotely, 75%, and nearly one in four of those remote workers, which is about 23%, said they would look for a new job rather than returning to a work site that did not implement the necessary safety measures. Uh, if you want to access the full report, just send me an email and I'll send you the, um, the website address for that. So these are the top five items that will help you implement the necessary safety measures to ensure your employees feel secure in returning to the office. And Hannah and Nicole touched on the fact that uh, we need to pay attention to federal, state, local public health agencies and OSHA and Cal OSHA. And part of uh, Cal OSHA is the COVID-19 prevention program that is required and it needs to be in writing. And then I'm also gonna talk about assessing the risk and identifying hazards and then implementing those safety measures. So periodically, just like Hannah and Nicole said, you need to check local, state or federal government websites on updates on the progression of COVID-19. All agencies advise following recommendations from the CDC, both OSHA and Cal OSHA have links to the interim guidance for businesses and employers to plan and respond to the coronavirus disease and specific infection prevention for specific industries. The CDC recently published a table of workplace controls that gives examples of controls to prevent the spread of COVID in the work environment. And that table can be accessed on their website. So the CDC is an excellent resource for returning to work safely. So returning to work safely requires an employer to identify any health risks to their employees and eliminate or reduce those hazards to the best of their ability. Employers will need to decide how implementing social distancing will work in their type of operation. Uh, they may need to consider workspace planning, which should also include common areas, um, also consider the gradual return of employees to the workplace. Instead of having everyone come back, let's think of how we can do it gradually, maybe staggering the return dates based on prioritization, adjusting shift schedules and or working hours to meet evolving operational needs. Consider workforce flexibility, uh, maybe have split time where employees come in a few days a week and others come on the alternate, day, alternate days. Depending on the business operations, the plan for the return of your employees will need to be flexible. And that's a big, that's a big uh, consideration is make sure you're flexible with what you're going to do to come uh, return to work. And so like um, Hannah and Nicole talked about, you have the federal OSHA, which on uh, this, I gave the website of their news updates. Um, and you also have Cal OSHA, and I'm not going to focus on, on the specifics of everything in 3205 or AB 685. I'm just going to touch on it. Um, 
it's effective. Uh, the 3205, which is the emergency temporary standard, is effective from November 30th to uh, November 30th last year to October 2nd of this year. So you have about 10 more months of this or nine more months of, of the standard. And like uh, Nick, um, Hannah said, they might extend that. Uh, and AB 685 is the enhancement enforcement and employer reporting requirements. From my perspective, what it does is it gives OSHA uh, a little bit more power on shutting down an, a, a, a workplace if they are not taking the measures to uh, keep their employees safe. So it expands that. And uh, Cal OSHA always had uh, Title 85199 aerosol transmissible diseases, which focuses on healthcare facilities. So they've always had that, and they, and, but they didn't have it for general industry. And so that's why they came up with 3205. And you, uh, I have links there for the FAQs. So if you really want to get into it, they have a lot of uh, answers to questions that employers have. If you go onto their web, uh, to the Cal OSHA website, you, they have plenty of FAQs for 3205 and AB 685. And 3205 just got uh, revamped and it's a lot easier to get through. Awesome, so, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so to comply with the uh, emergency temporary standard, an employer must develop a written COVID-19 prevention program or a CPP. Uh, this or ensure its elements are included in the existing injury, illness, and prevention program. So every employer has to have an injury and illness prevention program. So you can either make the CPP part of it or you can have it standalone. I find that most employers like it standalone because it's a little bit easier to put together and to just uh, map it out that way. So um, the, the elements of this is that you have to have the COVID-19 prevention hazards uh, testing policies and procedures for accommodation and reporting without fear of reprisal. So that has to be part of it. And then you need to identify and evaluate the COVID-19 workplace hazards. You also have to uh, keep record of the COVID cases in the workplace and also report them on your uh, OSHA log. And then what, how are you gonna correct any COVID-19 hazards or what, what um, thing, elements have you put in place to correct those hazards or to uh, minimize them? And then you must train your employees on all of the, the procedures and policies and, and things that you um, uh, are implementing for your CPP. And you need to also train them on the CPP for, uh, so that they understand what is required. Uh, it also has to cover social distancing, face covers, engineering and administrative controls, and PPE. And the reporting and record keeping access, tracking both work-related and non-work-related separately from the Cal OSHA log. Uh, record work-related COVID cases on the OSHA log. And then report serious illness to Cal OSHA when it's work related. So if it's a serious, if, if they get really, really sick and they have to be hospitalized um, and they did catch the COVID at the workplace, then that has, you have to call Cal OSHA within eight hours to report that hospitalization. And if that person caught COVID at the workplace and they are hospitalized and or pass away because of COVID, that also has to be reported to Cal OSHA within eight hours of the employer's knowledge. So the clock starts ticking as soon as you know about that hospitalization or that fatality. Well, see, I think there's just the whole program here that I think our audience, they need to know about. And, and I appreciate you guys going in, in, in depth, uh, but I know we have, a, we have a few, I think we're at the 5th, 12, 15 mark. Uh, we have probably allocated another five, 10 minutes for, uh, for Q and A, but Laura, if you can kind of share with us uh, so many points and we'll, get some questions and also some lasting points. Okay, I'll try to get through it as quickly as possible. <laughs> no problem. So um, again, the, you have to also have in your CPP the infected employee exclusion. Um, so like I said, in the FAQs, it answers questions like when must an employer exclude employees from work or what are the 
what is the criteria for the COVID-19 case to return to work, those kind of things. So you want to um, really get into that, that those are things that you have to be aware of and follow the, um, the standard. Because that's the first thing OSHA is gonna wanna see if they come out to visit you. They're gonna wanna see that written CPP. So the way you identify uh, risks and hazards is by using um, this particular graph where very high exposure risks are jobs that uh, have the potential of, of being exposed to um, COVID, which would be like medical facilities or laboratories, things like that. Uh, the next level is high exposure risk, which would be jobs with high potential for exposure, like maybe working for the public, things like that. And then the medium exposure is you may not be working for the public. Um, you might be working in a warehouse. You have coworkers that you might have lunch with that you can be exposed to. You may not be close to them um, in your everyday, every hour work practices, but you might have lunch with them. And so you could get um, exposed in that way. And then the lower risk are for jobs that do not require uh, contact with people um, at all. So though that would be the low risk. So the virus that causes COVID-19 spreads in several ways. Droplets when a person coughs or sneezes from touching contaminated surfaces. Um, so you need to understand the risk in your workplace and consider the following questions. Where do people congregate, such as break rooms, production lines, or meeting rooms? What job tasks or processes require workers to come into close contact with one another or with the public? What tools, machinery, equipment do you do people come into contact with in the course of their work? What surfaces are touched, often such as doorknobs, elevator buttons, light switches, uh, faucets in the bathroom, equipment, and shared tools? So those are the things you want to look at as far as exposure is concerned. And then you determine whether or not it's a high risk um, and if there is a hazard there, et cetera. And this is what you do to, to control those, those risks. Is, this is the NIOSH Hierarchy of Controls, which is the National Institute of Health and Safety. Um, and uh, elimination is the most effective way to get to control a hazard. Uh, so we can do elimination by working from home. Now we have vaccines. That's a way to um, eliminate the hazard. And substitution, well, there's really no way to substitute the hazard with COVID. So that there's no um, evidence of, of anything that anyone has come up with for substitution. So the next thing is, uh, if you can't eliminate the hazard, you have, you've got to try and engineer it out or uh, minimize it by engineering. And one way is through uh, monitoring your ventil ventilation. Can you have outdoor air coming in? Is your ventilation in your building up to par? Does it have all the right filters? You can check with your property owner or what, um, when it comes to your HVAC system. For example, now restaurants are doing outdoor dining. That's another way to um, um, reduce the hazard. Also alternating workspaces to maintain social distancing, the use of cleanable solid partitions, sneeze guards, plexiglass screens, hazard warning tapes, uh, remove or rearrange furniture. Uh, you could use uh, sensor or no let, low touch or sensors for no or low touch controls, which would be uh, automatic door openers, automatic receptacle openers like trash receptacles automatic toe, soap dispensers and towel dispensers, uh, automatic door openers, those type of things you can use to um, engineer out the, the hazard. Um, isolated workstations for employees with immune deficiencies, uh, routine use of disinfectants from the EPA, registered disinfectants, list ends, make, you gotta make sure you have safe uh, chemicals that you're using to clean. Um, you, procedures for facilities, shared equipment and spaces, work area and personal electronics and provide remote alternatives. For example, delivery or curbside pickup for restaurants and things of that sort. The next uh, step, if you can't engineer it out or to put in place in addition to your engineering controls, you do some administrative controls, which are work from home policies. Um, screening for temperatures, uh, social distancing, shift change procedures, staggering uh, work days. I think um, 
Nicole mentioned that earlier in her presentation. Uh, recognize high density areas and use that are being used and have staff to work on certain days and the others on, on other days. Are you gonna do temperature and symptom screening? You need to do those. Uh, COVID-19 testing is also a consideration to, um, to get, every, I, I know one construction company that they have their employees tested every week just to make sure everybody's okay and there's no um, asymptomatic people on the staff. Uh, of course, social distancing requirements, uh, floor markings, or other barriers to promote social distancing. Those are these are all administrative controls. Your cleaning and disinfecting procedures, hand washing facilities, and hand sanitizers, management and communication. Uh, monitor the so for management and communication, you monitor the state and local health communication about COVID, encourage uh, stay at home when sick and go home if you start to feel symptoms, no sharing equipment. So you have to have these kind of policies in place so that employees understand. And then again, you need to train them on the policies, train them on general hygiene. You can never hear these messages too much. Train, train, train. That is what creates a habit in employees. And then of course you need to enforce the, the, those uh, policies and procedures. And then the next um, administrate, uh, the next uh, hierarchy of control is personal protective equipment. So when you, when it comes to personal protective equipment, you have to conduct a workplace hazard assessment, you need to have that documented because Oak Kelosha will ask you for that. Determine what PPE is needed for workers uh, for a worker's specific job duties based on the hazards and other controls present. Select and provide the appropriate PPE to the workers at no cost. And then also you want to think about community protective, which is the face masks and things like that. So now, finally, I'm at my last two slides. <laughs> so I think I'm going to get done in time. But uh, so the next thing you have to do is you got to implement the measures to reduce the risk, right? Take that next step, make it happen. Um, in your IIPP, you have um, a, a, a disciplinary action, you know, a verbal warning, written warning, those like things to help enforce uh, your policies and procedures. Right, so you help, you'll have developed workplace disinfection protocols, a work from home policy for employees who are currently working from home and will continue to do so. Prioritize on which employees you'll be bring back first. Cleaning and disinfecting procedures have to have three levels, um, your routine cleaning, your deep cleaning, and after a confirmed COVID case, what, the kind of cleaning that you're gonna do in order for uh, people to feel safe after that exposure. Alternate work locations are the working from home, virtual offices, and, and people working from home consider completing ergonomic assessments for them. Um, or if you're doing any kind of workstation modifications, you also need to conduct ergonomic assessments. Um, have a plan around workers who may start to feel ill while at work, including who, um, who they should notify, how they will travel from the workplace to their home, and anyone with symptoms of COVID include fever, it chills, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat. So you need to train them on that as well. What are the symptoms so that they can recognize those? And then use the six feet distance, 15 minutes of contact within a 48 hours for formula for assessing exposure, um, for assessing the exposure of employees that came in contact with someone who had COVID and for the incident investigation. I want to stress that doing incident investigation to determine whether or not that COVID, um, that COVID um, exposure was actually work-related. So that helps to determine, to help you determine that. And it also helps to determine who in the person's circle may have been exposed. So uh, incident investigation is very, very important. And of course, documenting of that. So here we go, coming to the end. Continue to educate staff on staying home with, when symptomatic, On uh, communicate to them on hand hygiene, social distancing, other preventive measures. Plan to educate your staff on how you will proceed to keep the environment as safe as possible. Educate them on everyday steps for cleaning, disinfecting of high touch surfaces and the overall workspace. 
Remember when employees are working with chemicals, you must have safety data sheets and a hazard communication program. So those employees that are doing the cleaning, you gotta ha have hazard communication program and explain that to them. Train employees on what you require of them if they begin to develop symptoms of illness. Use the resources from CDC and WHO websites and be sure to check federal, state, and local information. Uh, Cal OSHA and, and Fed OSHA are excellent resources for um, complying with all this and keeping your work safe. safe. Uh, you wanna post signs, uh, occupancy limit in an elevator, occupancy limit in the lunchroom, occupancy limit in the bathroom. Um, I know where we work, we have a sign on our bathroom door that says only two people can be in the bathroom at one time, even though there's three stalls in there, actually four stalls, only two can be in there at the same time. We have a occupied, not occupied sign on there so that when there is two people in there, you can put, you know, there's that it's occupied by two people and people know in advance. Um, effective hygiene practices, you could post signs about that. Post signs about stay home if you're sick um, or had contact with someone with symptoms. Those are good to have right at the front door so that when an employee comes in, they can stop and they can think, have I been exposed to anybody? Um, you also can put signs on coughing and sneezing etiquette. What's the, you know, how, wear your mask, um, cough and sneeze into your arm. Don't spread it out into the world. And you have to train your employees on your um, CPP, COVID protection program, or it can also be called an infectious disease program. So finally, keep in mind that your employees might feel anxious about going back to work and of potential exposure. They may be coming back to the workplace with an overall sense of anxiety and fear of another outbreak and to an unsettled future. It also will also be important to demonstrate a willingness from management to listen to team members and to provide safe spaces for communication with, um, so that they can talk to you about their concerns without any retaliation. Ensure your managers and supervisors are showing up with a sense of empathy, checking in regularly with their teams at all levels and being transparent to help your employees come back to work feeling confident their workplace is as safe as it can be. It's really important to um, display that empathy to your employees so that when they come back, they will feel comfortable. And that's the end of my story. <laughs> Laurie, thank you so You're much welcome. for giving us, you know, I, I think, you know, hearing the word training and the CPP and all these different forms, I think there's a lot of uh, information that I think our entire membership and I think the entire Cal the state of California business owners need to be they need to be hearing this and like you said there's going to be enforcement starting more you know I, I think there's definitely a challenge of getting back to work but it is possible working with professionals like yourselves being able to create the structures in place because you know this is just the way uh, the new this new business climate is. And once we're able to build the systems and structures in place, and again, you know, I think there's a lot of things, and I do have a question for, for Linda. When, when you hear all of these points from the businesses and you hear about the concessions of landlords to tenants, I mean, do you think that that gap is going to continue to widen where there's going to be more requests for concessions due to the different uh, requirements or the requests uh, by Cal OSHA and all these other uh, provisions? It's a function of um, supply and demand when it comes to leasing, right? You know, the the more uh, inventory there is on the market, uh, the more concessions might be required to, you know, fill that inventory. And there are only so many number of uh, tenants out there. So, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the worse the market gets in terms of, you know, space being on the market, more space coming back to the market, the more concessions there is going to be to try to compete for those those few tenants that are out there. And, you know, hopefully those concessions can help these, these companies, you know, they have to spend money to, um, you know, try to mitigate, you know, all these risks within their offices as well. So, you know, it's, um, it, I definitely see that potentially happening in the next quarter, next couple of quarters, um, until we get a little bit more stability here in the marketplace. 
Your Thank you. No, definitely answered my question. Sorry about the mute thing. Um, we're 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 having uh, you know some requests from multiple people in the in the audience asking about the slides, and I can really understand they're proprietary. And you know this is the question: um, the, if they can request from you, uh, if is that possible? Yeah, I think we're getting we're getting nods from everybody. Yeah, yeah right. we're happy. To, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There we go. So perfect. So we can definitely email. If you want to email our chapter admin or we have their contact information, we're going to be posting that once we post up the, the webinar. But uh, does anybody have any questions, anything? I know this was a lot of information for everybody. Uh, and I think I myself have a lot of homework and Nicole, we're going to be, and Hannah, we're going to be talking and Brian, you know, we're going to, everybody here, we're all going to be talking about the next person we need to help because there's a lot of things here that need to be done. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't have any other questions uh, uh, in the interest of time. That is 1230. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank everyone who participated with us today uh, on this call. Uh, we really appreciate you take carving out time to, to be here with us. And um, we look forward to working with you in the future. So if you haven't, th have you, if you're not a member yet with CCI of Greater Los Angeles, you need to become a member today. And the reason why is because you're going to be able to connect with all of our different panel panelists and be able to be a part of this community. So, you know, it's, I, know I know it's a straight sell, but mm -hmm. we, welcome you, we welcome you to our group. We welcome our panelists to, be, to continue to be involved with our community and to offer their, their insight and services to our, to our, to our community. And uh, I encourage everybody to get involved because right now we, with, with the current business environment, you need professionals to be able to navigate these waters. So we welcome everybody to becoming a part of our group. And uh, for those who have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. And thank you everybody for joining. Have a great rest of your day and uh, happy new year. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Take care. Take care.